In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I will admit that when I looked at the lessons today, particularly the readings from Genesis and Luke, my first thought was to pull up all the slides from our Lenten Faith Forum book study on Father James Martin's Learning to Pray and condense them from six weeks into 12 minutes. Tempting to be sure, but probably more work than even writing a sermon. But I recalled that he devoted one chapter, which he titled, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep, to rote prayers. That is, those prayers we say sort of mechanically and repetitiously. Now I lay me down to sleep being a good example, the Lord's Prayer being another. Martin pointed out that there are a number of reasons why we pray rote prayers, a few of which were, well, we know them, and they come to us in times of trouble. Psalm 23 is a good example. They often express how we feel better than we can. Many of the prayers of the Book of Common Prayer do this. We unite ourselves with believers throughout the world and down through time. And here Martin points to the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. And he also points out that they can challenge us. They remind us of something we hadn't considered. But there's another reason, it seems to me, that he missed, or perhaps it was obscured by its opposite. That is, Martin noted that there were certainly some limitations to rote prayers, one of which was that repetitiveness can lead to meaninglessness. The opposite of that meaningless repetition could be that the prayer might begin to form us, perhaps subconsciously. Over time, it can, be, it can begin to recreate us in its image. We sometimes hear of couples who've been together so long that they might finish each other's sentences. Might not the same be said for praying a rote prayer, specifically the Lord's Prayer, or at least a portion of it. I sensed a hope for that remaking in the question of the disciple who had just observed Jesus praying. Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Teachers like John or Jesus or even the Pharisees often gave their followers particular prayers and practices that would help mark them off from other groups, as well as summarize the teacher's core principles. We've seen some hints of that in the Gospels where Jesus was asked why his disciples didn't act like the followers of the Pharisees or scribes. It would appear that Gentiles were taught to be worthy. In Matthew's version of the giving of the Lord's Prayer, we, we learned that some of them, they thought that some of those words might at least get through. Jesus' teaching was simpler, more brief, straight to the point, summarized in the Lord's Prayer. The matter of identifying with Jesus really began to hit me as I explored the grammar of the prayer. Yes, the grammar, specifically the Greek grammar. I imagine you're not surprised. I think many of you know that I think words and use of words is important. So I want to spend just a few minutes looking closely at this prayer, or at least portions of it, especially in the light of the idea that prayer specifically the Lord's Prayer, might serve to form us in the image of the one who taught it. To begin with, I want to return to how the story begins. A disciple observes Jesus, observes Jesus praying, and asks Jesus to teach his followers to pray. The implication seems to be, we want to be like you, Lord. Jesus prayed over and over, the Gospels show us. Observant Jews of that time prayed regularly, according to both biblical and extra-biblical evidence. 
So speaking to God was no unusual thing. And so Jesus's response was, in effect, whenever you pray, or at all of those times that you do pray, this is what you should say. We don't know if Jesus meant that his followers should only use these words, or that the overall content of the prayer should form the basis of the disciples' prayer. But we can assume that Jesus wanted the content to be central to the disciples' prayer life. That centrality of the Lord's Prayer is observed in our Book of Common Prayer. Every service includes a recitation of the Lord's Prayer. If one prays the full daily office, morning prayer, noonday prayers, evening prayer, and compliment, that means praying the Lord's Prayer at least four times a day. I believe, or at least hope, that that repetition might actually do something to the one praying it. That is, that it might begin to form the one who is praying into the likeness of Christ. Second, and here's where the grammar really comes in, and I apologize in advance for my geekiness. There is a reason. I want to look at those second and third clauses of the prayer. Father, uphold the holiness of your name, bring in your kingdom, we heard a few minutes ago. If we were to compare those to our more familiar liturgical use, we might see something a little askew. Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And here's the grammar lesson. It's all about the imperative voice. We often think of imperative voice as a command. The Ten Commandments are all in the imperative. We know who's responsible when you hear, you shall not. In the translation of the prayer we heard in our reading, it appears that it is God who is being told, uphold the holiness of your name and to bring in your kingdom. The problem is that the Greek has an imperative, specifically the third person imperative for which there is no English equivalent. That form is reflected in our traditional formulation. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Have you ever wondered what that means? I think many folks interpret it as a statement of praise. Oh God, your name is holy, but no. The Greek employs that third person imperative. What the sentence really means is something like, oh God's name, make yourself hallowed. How in the world would that happen? How does a name or a concept or a quality do anything on its own behalf? It would be like telling a table to transform itself into a chair. Unimaginable. Similarly unimaginable is the directive, again, the third person imperative, for God's kingdom to come or arrive. Does a kingdom have an ability to do anything by itself? The short answer, at least in English grammar, is no. And so some translators make the decision to designate God is the object of the commands. God, you uphold the holiness of your name. You bring in your kingdom or Father, reveal who you are, set the world right. Others seemingly turn the command into a wish. Father, may your name be hallowed, your kingdom come, or Father, may your name be held holy, your kingdom come. What I'm trying, however imperfectly, to suggest is that the hallowing of God's name or the coming of God's kingdom are not to happen because we are praying that God makes them happen. They happen because we who pray, we who are praying, as Jesus taught us, become that kingdom. We become the bearers of that name. 
our prayer life reforms us into the likeness of Christ. The carrying of our concerns to God in prayer is made real in acts of service and charity. Our expressions of praise of the majesty of God are made real in lives lived in humility, not only before God, but with others. Our petitions of repentance are made real in our interaction with those who offend us. And as we pray this prayer, with the persistence of the man who believed hospitality for his guest was of significant importance, or the insistence of Abraham pleading for God to show justice, as we pray this prayer, we are formed into a singular people, a people in whom others can see the dawn of a different, a more just realm. We become a people who give a body to a name that is different than the representation so often shown in the media. When we, when we pray, what we pray, we become. I believe that this is what Jesus was telling his questioning disciple, whenever you pray, say. Remember that Father Martin pointed out that one of the possible outcomes of praying rote prayers is that we become changed. And so I'm convinced that Jesus taught us to pray for transformation now into the living, active, justice-seeking Christ of 2,000 years ago. Are you, are we willing to pray this prayer with the expectation that we will be transformed? If not, why pray it at all? If so, hold on. Amen. Okay.